Tom, are you okay? I lost her. Her? She was going to be this epic, trilogy-worthy character. I was going to be the hottest writer in Hollywood. But I can't get past Act 1! You need some writer's group therapy. Hello, and welcome to Writer's Group Therapy. I'm Tom. And I'm Roshni. We're writers helping writers. Are you ready for your session? The doctors are in. And if you like what you hear, make sure you subscribe and share it with your friends. You can find us at writersgrouptherapy.com and online at WG Therapy, both on Instagram and Twitter, individually. I'm Tom underscore Loveman on Twitter and Tom Loveman on Instagram. And I am at Moon Lily Music on Instagram and at Roshni Lamino on Twitter. We have a lot to talk about today. It's, it's a lot of stuff going on, even for being in lockdown still. There's a lot I going know, on. Right? It's weird. The, the industry slowly, you can feel the wheels slowly churning. But like, I think there's a lot of stuff going on under the surface. You know, it's people like talk about how they, they're running out of things to watch, though. And I, I don't think I have. I have still have a lot, plenty of stuff to watch. How about you? Are you, are you keeping up on things? You know, we've, we've been watching a lot of stuff. Um, well, first of all, okay, I will admit right now, I've been doing a lot of, <clears throat> sorry, okay. Well, first of all, I'll admit I've been doing a lot of streaming, like, video game stuff. I've been really into that. <laughs> but we actually have kind of gotten, like, once we've exhausted all the American film and TV, we've gotten into foreign films and TV. So there's a huge catalog. There's still a lot to do. Yeah. Yeah, I've watched some uh, Korean drama myself. Yeah, you mentioned that. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, I watch a lot of anime anyway, and there's a whole that's a whole huge other universe as well. But yeah, I'm not—I haven't run out of things to watch yet, so I'm keeping keeping occupied as I do other projects too. You know, I will say it is an interesting because uh, we actually just watched. It's a little bit older, um, Train to Busan. Cause oh, the, great, great film, yeah. Which is oh yeah, and I don't normally like horror, but that one I was like, oh my gosh, because there's the sequel is actually coming out this year. And so I was like, oh, you know, the the concept sounded interesting, contained scripts, so let's watch it. And it's really cool to watch films and TV from other countries because everybody has a different, you know, value system and how they approach things. And it's just even the style Mm -hmm. of how they film it is different. So it's really it's if you want to be a well-rounded writer, I think you can't you can't go wrong watching stuff outside of the U.S. is basically what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, I, I learned a lot watching um, Crash Landing on You is the Korean dramedy, I guess you would call it, mm-hmm. um, that deals with South Korea, North Korea differences and stuff. So that was interesting. Um, and it was weird, too, because they, they blend genres like crazy. It goes from comedy to drama to action to thriller to romance, like all over the place. It's, it's, it's totally different from how we do things. And did it work? It was. I loved it. I thought it was great. <laughs> um, it was. Yeah, but it was. And and their episodes were so long. Like each episode was like an hour to an hour and a half. It was it was like wow. they were watching watching like sixteen movies or something. It was crazy. That's cool. I have to check that out. Yeah. Anyway, here in Hollywood, things have have uh, sl- like you said are slowly getting back to work here and there. The Writers Guild got together with the studios and made a new deal for the they call it the MBA, the Minimum Basic Agreement. And uh, they published all the details. You can look at the WGA, WGA.org's website. Mainly, they got, they got a lot of stuff. They got like increases in minimums. Uh, they got increases in residuals, increases in health care benefits. They got parental benefits for the health insurance paid by employers. Oh, that's good. Increases in uh, streaming video on demand residuals, too. Which is where it's going to go. <laughs> yeah, things like, you know, they gave examples of how much more you would get per half hour or hour episode on Netflix and Amazon and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Interesting. This is interesting for people like you and me. Uh, there's things called the new writer discounts were, were, were uh, destroyed. They're gone. They used to have these new writer discounts where studios could hire new writers at 25% less than the MBA rates. And same for screenplays as well, for episodic or screenplays. And they got rid of them because the NBA felt that it kind of pushed everybody down. And, and a lot of times they would stick the, you know, the underrepresented groups were disproportionately tossed into that new writer discount. Mm-hmm. So they felt that that wasn't fair. And the same thing goes for um, uh, when you're paying people on fellowships and stuff. You know, like you get paid on a fellowship um, and then you write something. You, now you get paid the same for that as if you were a, 
you know, a union writer. Oh, that's good. Yeah, it's it's great. You know, the, the trainee wage, I think is what they called it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, they've had a lot of shakeups in the last like year and a half. And I think they've been actually like quietly cutting deals right and left. And I think it's just like, well, first of all, this was the time frame where they were supposed to make big decisions anyway. But also I think they're like, there's a, there's something more important, like a pandemic happening. Let's just bury the hatchet guys. And yeah, get this let's get it out. done. Yeah. yeah. So that's good. So when things start opening back up for real, all of this yeah. is in place. Oh, there's one other really cool thing I wanted to mention. And this is a big issue that happened because of all the streaming networks doing these shorter runs and the cable networks doing shorter runs, like 10, 12 episode mm-hmm. seasons. Well, writers were being held between seasons where they couldn't go work on something else and they weren't getting paid. So they would have like up to 90 days where they weren't getting paid. Uh, They shortened that time that they can hold you between seasons to 60 days. So now in the course of a year, you're, you're not losing out half of the year waiting for your show to come back. So now you have more time or flexibility to go work on other projects. That's good. Yeah. So yeah, so that was good. So check it out on the the Raiders Guild website. Um, You want to get all the details and stay up to date on what the union's doing for us. Yeah. Yeah, once we get in it. (laughs) So speaking of once we get in it, other new things, the AMC Universal deal. Now that's been on everybody's lips lately. Wow, yeah. You know, we always talk about how the windows get shorter and shorter. It used to be, you know, years before things would come out on, on video. And then it was months, you know, six months or whatever, or nine months. And, and then it was now, now it's been three months. And, you know, it's to the point where you can be like, well, I'll just wait for it on video. And now it's, it's some of it's the same day. Some of it's, this is now the 17 day window. Not everybody's happy about it though. So from what I understand from the, the limited research I've done on it. So if you guys are interested, definitely, you know, go read, read it in the Hollywood Reporter or something like that. Like I said, I've only done some limited research on it. But when Trolls World Tour came out, the theaters were pissed because they would have gotten a cut of that, right? And so they got cut out of that deal. And so AMC and Universal struck a deal where now they have this 17-day run. And then afterwards, I believe when it goes to video on demand, AMC still gets a bit of a cut. They get a piece of the action, yeah. Yeah, but not all the theaters are on board because, I mean, how would you even decide, okay, so here's 5% to AMC and here's 2% to Regal and here's 1% to Cinemark. Regal and Cinemark aren't on board. So right now it's like all in AMC's favor, which is like good deal for you guys to, for cutting that deal, but ouch, what about the other theaters? Yeah, well, AMC is kind of unique because they actually have their own uh, VOD service now too. You can actually rent videos mm-hmm. from AMC through their app and they pushed it hard during the, the pandemic uh, to try to recoup some losses. So if they go with this deal with Universal, yes, they're giving up revenue in theater, but then they're making up for it because they're part of the streaming services that are going to reap that reward by running these movies sooner. I have to look at their, you know, this is really funny. Um, before lockdown happened, you gave me an AMC gift card. And the funny thing is, I actually don't go see movies in the theater that often it has to be something I really want to see. So I've sat on that card for months and then I was cleaning out my wallet and I'm like, Oh look, I have an AMC gift card. It's going to be worthless right now. Are they still even in business? And I, so I went on their website to see what I could do with it. And that's how I discovered the streaming service, but it seems to be a lot of older titles. Well, it's all they have now is older titles. (laughs) They haven't released much, much new on streaming yet. No, but there was some, I mean, there were some new releases like uh, right before the lockdown, like Invisible Man, or I'm trying to think mm-hmm. of what was in the theater yeah. right as lockdown was happening. But um, I'd have to look again at the the site, but I didn't remember seeing any of those titles unless it's changed since I've looked. It just seemed to be an older catalog is what I'm saying. Yeah. And the, and the catalog gets older each day. <laughs> <laughs> right now it feels like one long month. So forgive me if I don't remember exactly what came out before we went into lockdown. <laughs> But yeah, that will definitely change the face of, uh, you know, distribution in theaters. Mm -hmm. And speaking of distribution, the other new ripple is that Disney announced that Mulan is going to come to Disney Plus finally, but you still have to pay an extra $30 to watch it on top of subscribing to their service. Yes, they're uh, they're This is their, you know, experimenting with what's the market willing to pay. I don't think I'm going to pay $30 to watch it. Unless I can get 10 of my friends to come over. <laughs> but I can't have 10 of my friends over because of COVID. 
Social so. distance with the windows open, exactly. knock the roof off. You know, okay, I I get it. I get why they held on to Mulan for so long because they were hoping that the theaters would reopen. But now I'm kind of thinking you missed your window. This is just me because you and I have actually discussed this before. Like, what if Mulan came out next year when theaters are theoretically open, right? You know, because they were also holding on to Tenant forever as well. And they advertised Mulan so heavily back in the in the early winter because it was supposed to come out in March. And now who's watching the advertising? Who's paying attention? I, I It's one of those. You, do you ever feel like when you see something advertised so much, you feel like you've already seen it? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. And, and for a lot of people, they've seen Mulan, just not in the live action version. Yeah. So this is something back in March. If you had put it up on Disney Plus back in March, I actually might have paid 20 bucks to see it because we were all freaking out. We wanted something comforting. We had seen the advertising. But now it's been so long that I'm like, I can live without it a few more months. Right. I'm going to wait. In three months beyond that, it'll be you know just available to everybody who subscribes to Disney Plus already. Exactly. Yeah. So this is slated to come out September 4th. Who knows if they change that date or you know, yeah. suddenly change the pricing or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, it got pushed in the theater like two or three times. And I guess they just realized it's not going to release in the U.S. this year. And with Disney having Disney, Marvel, Star Wars, all these things going on, um, next year was getting too full, I think. Mm-hmm. You know, they, ha- they have things that are pushing into 2021 and then pushing into 2022 now. So they just decided, are we going to hold on to this, you know, this $200 million film for another you know, year or more, and then hopefully recoup it? Or are we just going to try to do it now? And I think this is just them experimenting with like, can we recoup this money now? I don't think they'll be able to. And especially, especially not at that price at the time. I mean, people are like the unemployment's been going on forever. People are like, oh my gosh, I'm going to lose that extra 600. Who knows if the $1,200 that they're talking about in, uh, in DC will happen. Like, if you wanted us to spend the money, you should have done it up front because now like everyone's going to be tightening their belts and going, I can't, I can't spend 30 bucks. That's grocery money. That's gas money. You know, I mean, we've been out of work for so long. You want us to pony up $30. That's like, that's like asking for a thousand dollars or something. I don't know. The economics don't make sense. I mean, if you just try to crunch numbers real quick, um, they have what 50 or 60 million subscribers. If you know, like, 3% of those actually fork over the money, you know, that's a million and a half times 30. It's about $45 million, not enough to cover anything really. Mm -hmm. That's then again, maybe people will decide to subscribe now because they can get that for their family. You know, maybe they have a large family and they have a lot of kids. Again, I think it's, it's um, kind of trying to make the best of a bad situation really. Eh, we'll see. We'll see. Mm-hmm. And speaking of upcoming releases, later on in our broadcast, we will have Matson Tomlin, screenwriter, joining us. He wrote Project Power, which is coming up. Or actually, no, let me rephrase that. It already <laughs> will have happened. Okay. And speaking of upcoming releases, later on, we are going to be joined by screenwriter Matson Tomlin, whose film, Project Power, was just released on Netflix. And that is definitely blockbuster worthy that that would be something to see in the theater for sure it's coming to the small screen thanks to covid but we'll have a chat with him later on in the broadcast interestingly though you know we talk about it being on netflix because of covid we're not really sure you know it it may have i mean netflix bought it in like 2018 so it may have never been released in theaters but it's a blockbuster style movie it's like action and special effects and you know jamie fox and joseph gordon levitt it's big names it's interesting that here a fairly new writer um, comes onto the scene with a blockbuster film with this, you know, uh, big budget on Netflix. So it really kind of gives me hope for some of my action films. <laughs> Maybe, you know, well, seriously, you know, well, Netflix is producing like hundreds of projects. They are producing so much content that they, you know, they're looking for things across all, you know, genres and all budgets. So it's it used to be just, well, I'll make my little independent film for couple hundred thousand and sell it to netflix well they're doing a lot bigger things now so i you know i've always been kind of a go big or go home kind of writer Mm -hmm. so this kind of excites me like maybe i don't have to go to warner brothers or you know you know 20th century fox or universal with my big action ideas 
you know, if you have a good story and a good film, you can get something into a situation like this at Netflix. And he'll talk, he'll talk about that more about how he did it too. So. Yeah. And one thing that's interesting about Netflix is they're one of the few streamers out right now that still focuses on independent and original content because a lot of the other ones, like when you look at them, um, Peacock, Disney, all of them, they're using their IP or they're doing remakes of stuff that they've already done. Oh, yeah. So Netflix is one of the few where if you have an original idea, you can go to them and they'll, you know, I mean, assuming that, you know, they want to make it, they'll make it because I don't think they, they don't have that kind of, um, what's the word, like institutional history where they're like, oh, we have uh, to, you know, catalog. keep, re- keep redoing, yeah, that's the word, you know, keep redoing the same, you know, projects. and. They are very edgy in that respect. They're really emerging as like the independent original content streaming service compared to everything out there, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, it's exactly what Apple Plus is trying to do. You know, all their content is original for the most part, except for a couple of films that they purchased. Yeah, you know, some of these streamers are, are all original, whereas, you know, the new Peacock, which is NBC Universal and HBO Max or is Warner Brothers, they're huge back catalogs. Yeah. But Netflix and, and Apple have to really, you know, crank out their own stuff. Okay. Can I just complain about Apple real quick? <laughs> <laughs> do you have the service? Have you tried it? I do because I have an Apple TV. So I got the service free for the year. Same with us. Okay. Do you run into this issue? This drives us bonkers. You'll see something and you're like, oh, I want to watch it through Apple. And then it's like, oh, you have to have purchased this through a different provider. Yeah, their their system is set up very oddly, and it's a lot like Amazon has been for a long time. Amazon's not as bad now, but Amazon Prime versus just things Amazon is selling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they mix it up, so you're like, oh, look, that movie's not here. Oh, wait, that I have to pay extra for. Yeah, I hate that. That bothers me a and lot. And then we just end up going to Netflix or something anyway, because we're like, this is it's an extra step that they shouldn't have. Yeah, Apple TV's problem is distinguishing between Apple TV, the platform, and Apple TV Plus, the service. So that's the thing. It's like they, you have to kind of pay attention to what you're looking at, but on Apple TV plus all their content is apples and it's included, but Mm -hmm. they also, because of the old iTunes store sell content. So yeah, it gets very complicated. Plus they, they're always what's happening. Plus they, plus they market the other channels. You can subscribe to epics and Showtime and HBO and all those other things and stars through Apple TV. And Apple gets a cut of those subscriptions. So that's why they do that. It's uh, unlike Netflix, which is just, here you are, have everything. You know, yeah. they actually have these other partnerships and revenue streams that they're working on. And Apple TV obviously still doesn't have its a huge catalog of its own content yet. They really do have to rely on other content within their, you know, within their um, Apple TV system. Uh, ease of use. They've lost us on so many things because it's just not intuitive. Which is weird because it's Apple. It should be intuitive. R.I.P. Steve Jobs, yes. (laughs) But also now on Amazon. Yeah. uh, Reclamation, uh, our sci-fi film, and Synesthesia, our our kind of uh, horror paranormal thriller, uh, our short films are both on Amazon uh, Prime Video now. So for free, you can go stream them if you have Amazon Prime, uh, Reclamation and Synesthesia. So please go check those out. Yeah, you get to see Roshni in action. Yay. Literally in action. I'm hitting people. Yeah, you get the like, fight scene. Self-defense guys, not, you know. Yeah, we're excited. We're finally able to share those with everybody who has Amazon Prime. So what things have you been working on, Roshni? Well, I just finished my first fantasy novel. I'm very excited. Yay. You're actually one of the beta readers. So. I am. I'm really enjoying it. It's got a lot of potential. It's huge. Of course, you know, being a writer, filmmaker myself, I seem visually like this would be awesome on the big screen, but as a book, it's great. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. It's funny. I, um, I read somewhere, so I'm looking into going the self-publishing route so we can discuss my self-publishing journey as I go, because there's a lot to unpack. I mean, it is, it is a beast of like, Oh my word. I'm like, maybe it's easier just to query agents with this thing instead of trying to self-publish. But you know, they, they did say one of the things I read was you shouldn't give it to beta readers until it's pretty much finished. And I get that. But the nice thing about I've given it uh, to you and to another writer friend and then to a friend of mine who loves fantasy. And the nice thing about having you guys read the first draft is you're catching things that I never even thought of. 
And I probably oh, yeah. wouldn't have caught it on a second or third pass anyway. So you guys are challenging me with questions like, well, wait, what about this in the plot? What about this in the you know narrative or whatever? So I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure we'll talk about it in the future. We'll get into details, but I'll just say, um, as a story goes, the plot and everything, it's captivated me. I'm drawn in. I'm enjoying it. And we'll get into, you know, your process of how you wrote it and how you, how you're rewriting it and stuff in the future. The great thing is it's a solid story and it holds together. It just needs, you know, tweaking here and there. So, so you should be really proud. I'm, I'm, I'm like amazed. I'm like, wow, this is just well, well plotted out. So. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. So like I said, we'll keep everybody posted on the self-publishing journey and when it goes live. So that'll be fun. So, and finally, last thing, back on set in a world of COVID. Just wanted to touch on that real quick. Now, it's slow and things have definitely changed as far as what they're looking for in terms of like, oh, you know, for example, if they want a family, they want people who've quarantined together and stuff. But the biggest thing is just all the protocols and how few people are on set. Like, honestly, you as a writer, Tom, you probably wouldn't be invited on set anymore because you're an extra person. I Sorry. probably wouldn't want to be there. <laughs> I'm too, <laughs> I'm too germophobic and freaking out. I'm like paranoid. I'm walking around like, who's going to get me? So, no, I, I'm fine with that. <laughs> yeah. So it's amazing. And honestly, people have really stepped up to the point. I thought that filming would take like five times as long because of all the cleaning and all the, you know, oh, make sure that this person can move on to the next station and stuff like that. But people have it down to a science. And I'm really impressed at the sets that I've gone on, how fast people move and how efficiently it runs, even with all the extra stuff of cleaning and making sure everyone's masked up and all that. So, yeah, um, I I would be curious, though, because I know a lot of showrunners are also writers. And like in film, the writers don't go to set because you've sold the project, you're done, you move on. But in TV, the writers are usually present so it would be interesting to see on a tv set as far as how that's running with the writers being on set or are they just- i would want i would want one of these um virtual presence things have you seen these it's like a like a segue with a pole on it and an <laughs> ipad at the top and so you get the person's face and they can move around the little robot around oh my so they're kind of like it's there but they're just like a face on a pole like that would be a script in itself, I think. Yeah. I, have you never seen one of those? <laughs> I've seen a segue and I've seen a monitor on a stand, but I have not seen them put together. Yeah, it's basically, yeah, like an iPad attached to the top of a, a remote controlled segue kind of thing. That is hilarious. Yeah. So you could have people kind of pop in and check out things without actually having to be there. And now for the highlight of our episode. Coming up next, we have our interview with Madsen Tomlin. And today, Madsen Tomlin is joining us. He is a screenwriter and director. His feature film just released on Netflix. It's called Project Power. He's also got a couple other films in the pipeline, Little Fish and The Batman, coming out later. And welcome, Madsen. Thanks for having me. So yeah, glad great to, have, to you. have you here. So glad to have you. Yeah. So you must be pretty excited. <laughs> it's a wild time. It's really, I mean, I obviously it's a wild time on on lots of levels, and some of the wilderness is not so fun. But it, it, you know, having this movie come out and finally being able to like prove to family members who don't really understand what screenwriting is and that actors don't just <laughs> like make it up as they're going along. Um, most of them at least, uh, you know, it, it, even when the trailer came out, it's like, there were so many people in my life that were like, wait, like you do this for real. It's like, yes, yes. Hello. Welcome. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's on the one hand, very fun uh, to have that personal part of it. But then on the other hand, just, feels so good to have a movie out in the world and have people seeing it. And at a time when we need it, when we're all stuck at home, you've got a captive audience. <laughs> that part is terrifying. That part <laughs> is, is like, oh, wait, everybody's looking at me now? <laughs> okay, this is fine. So Project Power started out as a spec script back in 2016. Here we are four years later, and it's on Netflix. Can you talk us through the process of from when you first conceived it to selling it to 
the process, the whole process? Totally. Um, I, I was in this phase, um, 2014, 2015 of, of, of starting my professional career. I'd, I'd gone to film school. I went to the American Film Institute for directing. I, I got out of film school, tried to make a movie, didn't pan out. And, you know, I, I, despite what the internet thinks, my mother is not Lily Tomlin. Uh, and I feel like I have to finally say that somewhere publicly. Um, we'll put that in the show notes. Yeah. I, I didn't have Lily Tomlin to, to, to get any favors for me. So I, I was really at this point where I was, you know, super, super in debt from school, no more favors, no, no celebrity friends or anything like that. And I had a choice of, you know, do I try to keep going or do I fly back home to the East coast with my, with my tail tucked between my legs? And the one thing that I could do was write. And at AFI, they, they had this phrase, you know, write your way to the table. And I, I, I found that to be so compelling and, and true. And so I, I started writing and I started this regimen of doing 10 scripts a year. And my deal with myself was these 10 scripts, they don't have to be good. They just have to be finished. I gave myself permission to be bad, which I think every writer should do. And you know, of those first 10, you know, eight of them were not great, but two of them were, were fine. And that, that, that kind of led to me eventually getting repped and then getting my first couple of assignments, which are things that didn't get made and nobody's ever heard of. And then winding up on the annual blacklist in 2015, which really helped move things along. But I found myself in, in 2016, um, feeling pretty frustrated because I had, I had had this, this initial pop with the blacklist and, and, you know, all of these, these, these good indicators that things were going well, um, but no movies were getting made. And I, I, I wasn't leveling up at the speed that, that I wanted to, I mean, who does, but, but I, I felt like I was doing something wrong. And ultimately what I, what I diagnosed is that I was writing scripts. I wasn't writing movies. And, and, and that sounds like it's the same thing, but it's, it's not, you know, I, I think that a script can be, uh, it, it can be any number of things. You know, I, I think the best example of a script is the, the second time that I was on the blacklist was with this, this uh, script called a deconstruction of reality. That was all about a writer writing a seventh Jason Bourne movie and trying to figure out like, how do we reinvent this character and make him relevant and soulful and have all the things that we love from the first three movies. Like it was, it was this meditation on franchise and it got me a lot of attention. It got on the blacklist. It did all of this stuff, but that's not a movie that's going to get made. If it is, it's, it's crazy that that gets made. And, and, that, and that's, that's a, you know, 0.001% that it gets made. And so that's what I mean when I say I was writing scripts, not movies. Um, I really needed to start thinking about, well, what actually gets made? What is the marketplace doing? And obviously, you know, people are really into superheroes and superpowers, all of that stuff. Like I, I love that stuff. I learned how to read off of comic books so that, that I had a primal connection to that genre anyway. Um, my interests were there, but I also knew DC is not going to hire me. They've never heard of me. Marvel's not going to hire me. They've never heard of me. I'm not going to go find an independent comic and, you know, try to adapt it. Like it's, I, I need to build this up on my own. And so knowing that the target was, you know, this kind of genre, I thought, well, well, what, what's missing? And what I, what I quickly landed on is I'm somebody who really likes to take multiple genres and Rubik's cube them together and, and, and genre bend them in ways that are kind of unexpected. And all of my scripts do this in, in one way or another. And my initial way in with project power was, Oh, I want to see eight mile, but with superpowers, that was the whole thing. It was, I wanted there to be this musical aspect to it. I knew, you know, I, I, I love rap. I love hip hop. And so there was this whole thing of, okay, what if 8 Mile had superpowers? What would that look like? What would that feel like? Can it have that grittiness and that realisticness? And also those characters where you really feel for them and feel like they're on this journey of trying to make it, whatever that is. And, and that was honestly the, the way in. The, you know, the, 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 the pill, the catchy idea, like all of that stuff came pretty quickly after. And I, I realized I wanted to tell this story about 
this 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 young black woman who sold power but also had this dream and didn't know how that dream was going to come true and that's that's very much how i felt about myself of having this dream and not knowing if it was going to come true and this this crazy system that i was facing and that she faces that's in front of her and how do you cut through the system well you've got to find your voice so that was thematically so much part of what i was trying to do there and then the rest of it was realizing you know well, it's also going to do what the genre really does, which is have these big scenes and these superpowers and these fights and all of that. And so pretty quickly on, I realized, oh, it's not eight mile plus plus superpowers. It's actually um, eight mile plus collateral plus, plus superpowers. And then suddenly it felt like a movie. Then suddenly it felt like, OK, there there are scenes there that I know how to write. Yeah, it, it I got to say it turned out great. I, I, I had a chance to watch it and it it has a very real feel to it, but then you get that little added boost of the, the, the superpower, you know, sci-fi aspect of it. But the characters are very grounded. They each have their own, you know, unique uh, character flaws, character strengths, and, uh, and they really work, play well together. So that was really um, well done. So you have a lot of, a lot of kudos there. No, thank you. So once you had this, this idea and you had this script, uh, what was the process of going to Netflix and and then you know once and getting your deal and then making the movie? Totally, um, wrote a spec script. I, I wrote it in a coffee shop in Caldy Coffee in Atwater Village, and you know I I then sent it to my my reps and they read it and they thought okay this is great let's let's send it to some people that that we think could be good for this on the producer side. Um, I met with a handful of folks and and. Brian Unclis and Eric Newman were were among them, and they seemed to really get it. You know, they seemed to to not only really love the story and understand what it is that I was trying to do, but they 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 had a real plan for okay, this is how we go and get this movie done. You know, they were in the process of of really getting movies made, and I wanted to see this movie actually get made and not just turn into a piece of development. So the process was on on the timeline of movies especially for a movie of this size an original an original film like it, the process was lightning fast where you know 2017 by by July of 2017 Brian and Eric are on and we've also gone and met with some directors we meet Henry and Rel I totally fall in love with those guys they're on you know we we have some actor conversations and 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 we start to identify who we want and of course like Jamie Foxx is at the top of the list, but we're like, man, how are we going to get Jamie Foxx? Like he's Jamie Foxx. And so then that whole team, me, my script, Brian, Eric, Henry and Rel, uh, we all went to Netflix together. We went to, to a, a number of places. It, it turned into this crazy bidding war where, where the whole town kind of wanted it. And that totally made my head spin. It was, it was a dream come true and totally overwhelming and, and kind of unlike anything I had experienced at that time. Netflix won it and uh, they were really committed to making the movie quickly, aggressively. You know, they, they, they said to us right in the room, like, we see this as a, a real movie that we want to go and make. And, and that to us was, was everything. Um, and they, they put their money where their mouth was because, you know, 10 months later we were shooting. Wow. That's impressive. <laughs> Instead of being in like development purgatory forever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you seem to be doing a lot in the like supernatural superhero genre, like all your upcoming projects or adaptations or originals of, you know, some sort of superhero type script. What is it about that genre that really uh, piques your interest? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's fair to say that I learned how to read through comic books. Um, you know, that, that it's for me writing whatever i'm doing it has to connect to something primal it has to come from somewhere real and you know there some of these characters i just i deeply deeply love you know i i deeply love batman like i just do and so you know whether whether or not it's it's the 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 fancy stuff like that whether or not it's something original whether or not it's it's uh you know i'm i'm working on an adaptation of, of fear agent with 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 the point gray guys right now um a big part of it for me is just, you know, I'm, I'm lucky in that back in 1995 when I was a little kid and, and comic books were, were not mainstream and not cool still, 
uh, you know, it seemed like, well, I have to hide my comic books in my backpack so that nobody sees. And now it seems like, well, this has been so accepted. This has become mainstream. So I, I, I really just feel lucky that something that I was into and have been into is is now the thing that is getting made. And so, so much of it is using that genre, whether or not it's it's superhero stuff or superpower stuff or sci-fi in general, using that as a vehicle to tell honest, real stories about stuff that's going on in our real world. I think that's what all good sci-fi should do. Um, I think that's my answer, you know, and, 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 uh-huh. and but then on, on the flip side, there, there's something like Little Fish, which is a, you know, not comic booky at all and, and not even very sci-fi now that we're living through a pandemic. Like that was the big sci-fi thing of it was, was this pandemic. And, and, uh, you know, that's a love story. That's a very grounded character drama. So I'm, I'm kind of all over the place. Yeah. You, you, I've heard stories about how Netflix is like, I guess I'd say easy to work with. They're kind of like hands off. They're like, you guys go make your film. Um, but I know, I, I know like every film goes through changes. Was there anything in your original script that didn't get make, made it into the, into the final film that you really love that you're, you're kind of like, Oh, you know, I, there a, a lot changed from, from the original and, and the, the, the script, you know, it's out there. People can, can go find it. Uh, it, it, it had an extremely dark ending and this movie doesn't have that dark ending anymore. And do I, do I wish that that existed? I mean, on some level, sure. Like that would be cool to see, but I also, I just know the way of the world and we made a movie that is a lot more fun. It's a lot more wish fulfilling. It, it is right for this time when the world feels totally on fire and, Everybody is kind of dealing with with so much stress and ex- existential dread. I don't think that we need another movie that is full of stress and existential dread right at this second. And so, ultimately, did things change? Yes, of course. I, I I miss my darlings in kind of an intellectual way, but not in a visceral way. Viscerally, I feel like you know what these guys made a really cool, fun, big movie, and and that's I'm really good with that. And you're also a director. Any any chance you'll be jumping back in the director's chair or what kind of project would actually get you to do that? Yeah, for sure. I, it, um, it's one of those things that it, it, it feels like we're on the precipice. Um, I, I've come very close once or twice now to, to, to getting a couple of different projects off the ground. One in particular, it's a little early to talk about it, not because it's it's secret or or fancy, but just because I feel like if I talk about it, I'll jinx the whole thing. But you know, the certainly coronavirus of it all has has made things much more complicated for productions. Um, just a so little bit. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's one of those those wait and see kind of things. But you know, I I say this to people and they they compliment my writing is that you know, the, the only reason that I'm a good writer is because I'm directing on the page. That's all it is. And um, for me, writing should evoke emotion and it should evoke images. And you can use all the same tricks that, you know, a director has at their disposal. And, you you know, you should be backing the director up by saying, you know, this is how I see the scene, not just here's what people say, but this is where the camera is. This is how we're feeling. This is how quickly we're moving. This is how quickly we're cutting. You know, I, I, I use all of that in the scripts and I don't worry about quote unquote over directing on the page because the director is going to do whatever the hell they want to do anyway. If they don't like my idea, totally cool. But at the same time, I think it's the writer's job to really have a vision and have a point of view. So, I mean, that's a long way of saying, uh, yeah, totally. You'll, you'll see a movie by me, hopefully sooner rather than later. That is awesome. And that's actually great cool. advice for, for upcoming writers. So Matson, if people want to find you, how can they find you? I am uh, pathetically, extraordinarily active on Twitter. I love Twitter. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm there every day. Um, there, you know, my, my handle is my first and last name. It's very easy to find. Um, I, I, I try to talk to writers or, you know, young creatives or, you know, people that are trying to start out all the time. I try to give advice. I try to, you know, help people out. I can't read stuff that they're writing, but if, if people just want to talk shop, I'm, I'm always down to talk shop because it, it's so brutal trying to start a career. 
And uh, it, it, <laughs> You're it, doing it, a great job at it. <laughs> thanks. It, it, it only feels like six seconds ago that I had literally nothing. You know, I, I, the, the feeling of waking up every day and realizing no one's going to call, no one's going to email. My mom's going to call, but like, other than that, like, like no one is going to call asking about what I'm working on or wanting to read anything. It's just me and my computer. And I have to write and hope that someday it works out. That's such a brutal state to exist in. And it's still so fresh for me that I have a, a tremendous amount of empathy for the people that are there. So anytime I can say something that is helpful for somebody. I, I'm not a screenwriting guru. I don't have any answers. I have what works for me. And if that resonates, great. If it doesn't, it's just more more data. That is cool. terrific. Thank you awesome. so much. Thank you. So definitely check out his new film project, Power, now on Netflix. Best of luck to you, Mats, and thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. This is fun. We hope you enjoyed this session of Writers Group Therapy, and if you did, please leave us a review on iTunes or whichever platform you're listening on. And visit writersgrouptherapy.com to catch up on all our other great interviews. Thanks.